So the Germans came in March 44. For you, I suppose, it was a complete surprise? It wasn't was a complete surprise that we had to start wearing the Aero Star. It wasn't a complete surprise to see the Germans because we saw them already before. Because um, actually, we saw them already about a year before they used to come in from the back from the Polish border and when they came across. We saw, but they didn't stop or didn't, uh, didn't sit and now they it drove was, through. Now it was an now occupation. It was an occupation. So it was different. Then we didn't dare to go out on the street anymore. We had the yellow star, you didn't want to go to yellow star in the village because everybody knew you. In the city, even then, you didn't want to go around, only if you had to. And basically in the village you didn't have to because you had the food at home, you had everything at home, so we didn't have to go out. So at that time you left the yeshiva and uh, went I, back I home? I don't remember. I don't. I, no, I didn't. I didn't live in the city anymore. I don't remember if we went in still for a shiurim. I don't. I don't remember. I don't think so. Once the Germans came in, I don't think we did. So uh, basically, you came, we're sitting home. You came home. You remember the last Pesach at home? Yes. Was it different? And uh, not really. It was still the same thing. We didn't think. We had the yellow star, but we were inside the house. My cousins didn't come out anymore. It was more quiet. You didn't, you know, you didn't start singing and play stuff. But, but we were still the family together. We never, we were never thinking even then that we, that we have that they're going to be deported. It was, I think, one or two weeks before, a week before play stuff, two weeks. There was the Juden right, and the Juden right went out. I remember they came out to the village just to collect money if you had any money because they said they could pay off the Germans not to harm us and not to do this, so they're collecting money. But otherwise, it, it was still the house. They never thought that one day later that we were going to be gone. So the atmosphere wasn't very tense. It was tense, but now, you know, you were tense so much that you were afraid to go out on the street the Germans might beat you up or might something. But you were, uh, I didn't think you were afraid that they're going to shoot you, but they beat you up if you were a Jew. At that time, you don't remember that you already prepared a rucksack with, uh, no, no, no. with we, things? No, no, we didn't. The rucksack came right, up, I think, either the last day of Pesach or the day after Pesach when they told us all you could take with you, but you have in the thing, and we're going to go. And they told us that they're going to take us into the brick factory. They, um, they came to your house because I suppose in the village it wasn't like in, in the city that uh, no, they, they the announced village, about the village what's actually, going to happen. We are the last ones to know because our yard was the biggest. So by the time they came to us, they had all the Jews together already in the front yard. They came out and everybody was there already ready to take us, but that was only, they walked us into the brickyard. Uh, they were the Hungarian... Uh, no, there was the SS was there. The Hungarian the police... Not the, not the Hungarian yeah, yeah, with the they feathers? Were, they, they were both there, but we only had like in a village, like the whole eight villages had two of them. You know, they used to go from village to village on bicycles. So if I remember correctly, the Germans, I don't remember, I can't swear to it, I don't, but I think the Germans came also. They were both of them. It wasn't the Hungarian army, it's some of the German army, some of the uh, the police, the country police. They gave you a day to prepare or from I now to... I think from night till the morning or something like that. It was a couple of hours. You remember what did you take with you? Was, was it something important that you wanted to take with you? We took with us basically, I think, some food, which wasn't much because they just had to prepare it after Pesach. Uh, some clothing, because you could only have, I don't know, 20 kilo or something. And you had to have, take some pots and pans because you figured you have to cook over there. Uh, you don't remember any special book or something no, like no, that? No. 
I don't even remember if I took my phone with me. I don't remember. I suppose so. I suppose I, I don't remember. I'm sure my father took his thousand phone, but I, I don't remember. Sidur, uh, Sidur, yeah, Sidur, yeah, Sidur we took, but uh, not not too many, not too many other books. They never, we never knew. Everybody thought it's going to be a couple of days, and you come home, like it happened two years before, and they took, took them to come and see the dolls and Kalamai, and they came back. So everybody thought, oh, it's the Yudnarat is going to take care of it. They're going to pay him off. And you never thought they were going to go any further. After that, from there, you couldn't go out. I only went out from the ghetto once, and it was like a lay for some labor. They found it was a very rich Jew, and they started digging. They found something there, so when they took us out to help dig, my father gave me some money. I guess he had with him. I should go out and buy some bread. Went to grocery, got caught, I got beat up. My father says, you're not going anymore. You don't volunteer, because you volunteer. Because he figured he could go into a store and buy something. And I was caught. So I let me do anything. immediately after Pesach, you were taken to the brick factory? Uh, yes. It was uh, outside the city? Well, it was outside, uh, but the, the brick factory? No, it was towards the city, just, just in the outskirts of the city. And they had the... You know, they that, had means, to that means only roof? Without walls, yeah, without walls around. Without walls around, that's right. Only the the whole Jewish population of of Ujhorod itself was and the villages around it. No, there were two ghettos. Yeah. Yeah. No, and there were two ghettos mm -hmm. I'm sure. There was there was another lumber yard which was called Gluck. The Gluck Lumber Yard. They had the, the Gluck Lumber Yard and the brick factory. That was all the Jews from the vicinity and the city. Well, suppose that the Ushurat had 10,000 Jews, with the vicinity maybe more, but a lot of them were at forced labor camp. Anybody 20 to 40 was a forced labor camp. Your grandfather was still alive at that time? And my grandfather was alive. My grandfather, somehow I don't remember how he did it, we sent him into the hospital that he's sick, but a day later they brought him back from the hospital. He, Actually, he didn't come with us to Auschwitz. He went three days before it, another bro my father's other brother, younger brother, they, he went with that transport. We went with the very last transport out of Oshola. What do you remember from the ghetto? The ghetto, not much. We were just mingling around, and we had to sleep on the floor. We still cooked some pasta and this. And, you know, we're still together. And we saw already that they're taking transports, but, you know, the rumors are going around, oh, they take them, there was a big Hungarian <coughs> landowner that he needs work for the summer, for the army, because they need more food. That's where they take them for labor, which was maybe 20 miles, about 30, 40 kilometers away. And we didn't hear actually nothing till we got to it. We weren't taken away till after Shuot. Actually, three days after Shuot, three or four days after Shuot. Shuot, the date here, if I'm not mistaken, was the 28th of May. I don't, I don't remember. That date I don't remember. Three days after Shuot, the brickyard was empty already. Two days after Shuot, where my grandfather went away, with my uncle, I think, one day or so. They took us into the other ghetto and we were staying there till Shabbat. Shabbat afternoon, they took us uh, all on the train. That was the last transport. What were the rumors there? Well, still the, the same thing that they just took on some place for the farm labor. Nobody, nobody actually knew. We didn't believe in the whole crematorium. If the, if the, after I left Auschwitz, we just started hearing rumors over the crematorium. But you know, your f your grandfather was seventy years old. He was eighty-six. Eighty-six. At that time, it was ve even today. Which it's one? not young, but yeah. uh, at no, that no, time it was very, very old. It was yeah. obvious that your grandfather is yeah. not going to work yeah. anywhere. Well, we didn't know where he is when he was, but uh, they said nobody talked about. 
maybe some of the older people knew what it is, but they didn't want to talk about it. I think they didn't want to scare us. And my, my grandfather, the older brother, was 88, which so happened that they were all alive. They were all old, all his brothers. And uh, you know, you had a brother who was less than 10 years old. My had a brother who was eight. Never. That's uh, that's another story. But did you think that you are going to work and the family will be? We uh, to be honest, with you, we didn't think. Nobody thought as much as a case or whatever will happen will happen. You don't have a choice. You can't go any place. You got it all with the. Punches. There was no place to go. No one talked about the possibility to try to run away or to no. hide, no. Uh, no. to no. go to ask some uh, uh, Gentile yeah. friends yeah. for help or something like N that? No, because at the, the truth is like Budapest, like my wife was, she lived as a Gentile girl through it. But in a small town, there was 20,000, 20, almost everybody knew you. And the Gentiles, either they were afraid or they were really didn't care. I don't think in the whole city, I, I found out later, there was about only one family, Herskovich. I think there were six of them that, that somehow had they escaped in the same courtyard where they lived, that some guy hid them, and then they got up to Budapest somehow. But a kid at my age, I don't think any, Anybody, you see, you see the, the ones that were big enough and young enough, they were away in Russia someplace. When you arrived to the ghetto, to the brick factory, was your father uh, interrogated by the Hungarians? They no, usually no. They usually took the, yeah. the people they knew that, that they had money. Yes, yeah, some, no, my father wasn't. And actually, my uncle was the one who was the rich one in the family. He wasn't either. They only took the ones that they had something they heard or something. And then, like this family, like I said, we went to to dig out the, the, the they thought that they found treasure there. But uh, I don't think the old man was taken to interrogation. The two of the sons were away in concentration and nothing in a labor camp. Matter of fact, they lived in Los Angeles later on. Uh, but there were some people they were taken even before. If they thought that you do any black market business or something, they were taken to interrogation and they were very uh, punished and then in, 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 in uh, how shall I say it? Uh, they went through a lot. Now you know, to try to try to get this, uh, things out of them. Did your father hid anything before you went to some, the uh, some, some little things. He had some dollars and some jewelry. And so you we, you we didn't... We put in the ground. You didn't hid in... in uh, you didn't hide it in your clothes or... No, no. Inside the shoes or things no, like that? No, The shoes, no. Shoes, we didn't have anything. Because that we didn't know to hide to the shoes. When we came to Auschwitz, we found out. But even they, they took away the shoes, most of the shoes. No, no, we didn't have it. We hid it at home in the garden, buried it. When I came home, I didn't find anything because it so happened that the Russians had put a cannon down there and they were shooting from there someplace. So they, they probably undug it and they found it. Because when I came back, there was a big hole there. So you were in the ghetto something like uh, uh, six, six weeks. weeks? Yes. You were hungry in the ghetto? Uh, we didn't have as much to eat as a teenager wanted, but uh, no, we weren't hungry. We weren't starving in the ghetto, no. In the ghetto, we always, there was enough to find here and there. And some of the gun brought in something you know, a little bread of this, some of the gun brought in, but not much. Most of them said we they're scared. They brought the drop and said, don't expect them to come back because I'm scared to do it. But some came in, you know. And then on the last uh, transport, you were taken? We were taken, yes. You it was a Shabbos afternoon, and 
they were putting in the wagons. And that was, I think, the last, probably last 1,500 uh, people from Mumbai. That was the end. So they were the human fraud. You remember the journey? Yes. And the journey, we were still happy. I mean, happy it wasn't because, like I said, there was no facilities. They gave us some pills, and we were running on top of each other, but we still had some food that we took from the ghetto. So we weren't hungry. We didn't know where we were going. They told us to go someplace. I don't remember. Somebody found out some rumor where we were going. And we were still they, singing. They didn't talk about a place called uh, Kenya Mesa? Uh, uh, no. They were saying, basically they were talking about this land, and I, he wasn't, no, it was another name. Which one are you talking about? Did you say the name? Kenya Mesa. No. I, I heard Kenya that no. in Cluj they in heard Korea, about Cluj, it. But that's Romania, that's Colorado. That was Romanian, that was another end. But yeah, but uh, I don't even know if, if this place uh, exists. exists or they, they yeah. only made it up. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. But uh, we were going uh, on the way to Auschwitz, we were still singing. As a matter of fact, there we were more kids and always singing the Bnei Kiva songs, the Hebrew songs, the Hungarian songs. But when you went through Kasha, I, I we didn't suppose... didn't go through Kasha, I don't think. Usually, uh, to get out of Hungary, it's out of you Hungary, went through, I think through, through, through Kasha, three. and that means that you're going to the east. You're not well, staying we know. in we Hungary. Were we were inside the wagons were closed. We don't know where we went. I think, if I remember, I thought we went through Vienna somehow. But now it doesn't make any sense, because uh, we had to go towards like the Kasha, Lift of Sixwati, Mikolash, and going to Auschwitz. But we didn't see where we go. It was a little, was a little window about as big as this uh, thing that you could look, and nobody could even get to it. We were just sitting, like the French were sitting, get singing. I mean, the older people were singing, but the youngsters were still singing. There was no panic in the wagon. In the, in our wagon, there was no panic. I, I don't know how, but we were mostly youngsters. I know they must have been, the parents must have been there, but they were more young people than the middle-aged people. When you arrived to Auschwitz, was it uh, day or night? Uh, early in the morning. must have been 7, 8 o'clock in the morning. You remember your first impression? Well, when we got out of the train, we didn't know what's going on. And the biggest that I can't, even till today, I, I, can't, I can't talk about it almost, was that they said men and women separate, that we understood. So my mother and the four sisters went to one side, and we went to the other side. My little brother was eight, held on to my hand, I'm coming with you, I'm a man too. And as we were walking, the says grabbed them and pulled them away to the other side. We didn't see my mother, and I remember my father yelling after them, go find mommy. Whether he ever found mommy, I don't know. And whether he went to guest chamber by himself, but I don't know. I don't ever know. He was only eight years old. If he was lucky enough at least to hold on to her skirt, I don't know. You were with your father I and was grandfather? Father. No, my grandfather. No, my grandfather ah, you said that he, he, yeah, went, he went not with you. No, my grandfather was would, would just too old anyway, but he went to transfer the forest. And uh, my father your and I... Your father was something like 60 uh, No, he, was, he was exactly 50 years old. Wasn't even you 50. said that he was born in 84. 94. 1894. He was 50 exactly. He would have been 50 while well, he was 50 in Rosh Hashanah. But he was with me. And uh, we were going on one side, and then 
and see my mother. I found out later that my two older sisters did make it out to work camp. They were in Riga. And that was one of the reasons that I was going to come because somebody told me uh, after that they went home, another they went home, that they went to work labor camp. And, but they never came home. I found, uh, met some girls later who, was, who were with them together and they said that in January or February, one, the older one contacted typhoid fever and the younger one was sneaking in to help her and actually the younger one died before the older one. But one, that was in Riga. One of them was at the time 15, 15 years old and the other one was, was 13 14. and a half. It was about 18 months apart. Actually, she was born was in 1945. She was born in, in 29. Yeah, she was, she was almost 15 and a half and the other one was 14. You were with your father, you, yes, you didn't we understand anything of what's going on? But then we didn't know. They were talking about that they're burning people, but only the sick. Everybody was telling something else. And uh, they put us into a, one barrack. There were 2,000 people in that barrack. And after eight days, we left Auschwitz. I never even got a number. I got a number here, but I never got a, a tattoo number. We left Auschwitz after eight days, we went to a place called Koffering. With your father? With my father. But what do you remember about those eight days in, in eight days, Birkenau? Uh, the eight days in Birkenau, just that every morning and every night we had to get up for an appell count. And we got some tea and, you know, <laughs> some dirty water thing. And we really, you couldn't think anymore. We, I remember the fence was in front. They said, don't go to the fence, don't touch it because it's electrical. And we didn't have any room at all in those days. We had 2,000, I think there were 2,000 people in our barrack. I but think 1,000 usually. I, know, one time, I think it was more than 1,000. All of them Hungarian speakers? N there were some Romanians, some, hung mostly Hungarian speakers, but not from the same part of, of the country. Some of them from Transylvania yeah, yeah, some, or Yeah, we, are, we all uh, mixed. They came, I don't know how we came together, but I remember we couldn't, we couldn't lay down. We were just sitting one in the other's lap. And then after, about, I think it was about eight days, they shoot us up our transport and started counting. And every day, we did, my uncle had three sons, and I was my father, and his cousin was there. We actually had three sons, but one of the two, he was deaf, so they took him to the left side. So he was with the two sons, and my father and I, we made one lane. They, in the before, front of us, there was another cousin who took one lane, and behind me was my uncle and his three sons, and uh, one more second cousin. And I remember the only thing, because you say thousand, I remember I think they counted up thousand people we went to Koffering. And my uncle, we were the thousand. My uncle, I never saw him again. I think I later I found out that he came to Mauthausen. So I remember it was more than 1,000 in the barrack because we were together in the barracks and we were standing up. So actually from our area, from the Ungwar area, there were only 20 of us in Koffering when we came. The rest of them were mostly from Romania, Arad, Kolo... Uh, mm. Arad, no, Arad was no, not uh, Hungary. Not Arad. Uh, the north not of in, Transylvania, uh, Siget, uh, No, no, Cluj. Was Siget, Cluj. Mostly from Cluj. Matter of fact, there was the Levis there, and the Kurdish, uh, some of them, some of them I knew in Los Angeles after the, after the war. And... Uh, Did you eat? Where? In, uh, in Birkenau? The yeah, Birkenau, there? yes, yes, what they gave, whatever they gave us. Yes. My father in the beginning, even to the end, he didn't want to eat meat. He didn't give us too much, when they gave it this much, he didn't want to eat it. But, uh, but he is, then we came to Koffering, that was an Arbeitslager. From there we went out to work. In Birkenau, 
Uh, you said that you didn't really understand what's going on because no. mostly you were in your barrack. Uh, yeah. You didn't go around, you didn't know what's going on. No, you going. couldn't go around. All, all you could go, the other side, they counted us. I don't know if you, anybody explained what an appell was. Appell was when you lined up and mm -hmm. they counted us. And, uh, and then we went back. They gave us some uh, tea or, or what they call durga music, some dried food and stuff. Then we went back to the barrack. We couldn't stay outside. You couldn't go from one barrack to the other. And although I understand that you heard from the couple or from someone else that uh, there are burning people there, no, you we couldn't really there, understand we never, it. We never, we never heard. We smelled something burning. We smelled something burning. And people, people never, we didn't know what it is. Some people said this, some people said that. There's some, pe some people said there might even be people that they're burning because they died or whatever. But we really never seen the crematorium because in Segaina Lager, we were a little bit far from the crematorium. All we, we smelled. And my father always said, oh, I don't know, my, my, my brother found his mother. We never even thought of it that they're not alive anymore. When, when you were there, the, uh, the gypsies were already gone? I, they, they, were, they, called, they told us the lager that we were in, there was a Tsigayna lager, and they were mostly Jews over there, as far as we knew. I don't know, the next barrack could have been gypsies, but we never saw them. But we saw from both sides, so it was mostly Jews. So the, the gypsies must have been gone. You didn't have any connection from any kind with the SS in Birkenau? No. The first SS we had is when we were on the transport to Kaufering, who the guy who became our, our Lager Führer was an SS. But most of the the, the guys, the guards, were Wehrmacht, and he was he was a miserable guy. But luckily, we only had him for three weeks because uh, when we got to Kofering, we were the ones who built other lagers around there. We were the first one, and this uh, assess what we were in Lager Dry, and he was transported to Lager Lager Ford, I think. And they brought us a new lager Führer who was also Wehrmacht. So we really didn't have an SS guards or SS lager Führers. It was all Wehrmacht. Usually they were a little better than little the better. SS. Not much, but a little better. We had so happened that our lager Führer, not to give any credit to the Germans, he had and a lot of people died over there because we worked, uh, most of our work went to a company called Moore, who they were making big bunkers, cement, and they were dragging the cement all night. If you got into that, to that group, you had two weeks, three weeks to live. That's it, no matter what. But no matter how strong you were. But he said that from his group that he gives out the work, Nobody could be beaten. If he finds out that somebody beat, you know, the foreman, they beat uh, one of the prisoners, he's gonna, he's not gonna give him any more labor. There was, uh, there was our lack of freedom. The other lagers didn't care. He was, he, he was sort of a nice guy. He was, the German. he was uh, at I, the time old. No, he and wasn't that old. Couldn't go to the front, or was he, uh, he wasn't crippled that old. or something? Maybe he was. Uh, maybe he was injured. Maybe he was. But I think he wasn't even, I don't think he was German. I think he was from Luxembourg. Something somebody said that he's from Luxembourg, basically. He wasn't German. That was our life. So even if he didn't help, still he didn't abuse you? He didn't, he didn't abuse us. We had some. We had some hangings in the camp, but uh, because it was stealing or something. But that was in He even gave, my father was one of them, he even gave permission for 10 people, for 10 Jews, to a Yom Kippur night to say, Kom Nidrei. My father was one of them. He gave him permission to ask him. I don't know how they asked him, I don't remember how it came about, 
But yeah, because we had a Laga Schreiber who was Bardo, she was a banker also from Cluj someplace. And I don't know, he was he was in the he was in, in camp, he was uh, the Laga Schreiber and this. He knew him somehow or other they came out that they let ten Jews say Kony The the Kolnidre at that time, that place had a special meaning for you? I didn't hear it. They took me out of sight, only 10 people. Did you fast that young people? I don't think so. I fasted because they didn't give me nothing to eat. Yes, I don't think I fasted. Did anyone have a sidur or something that no, the people no, prayed no, for? No. No. Uh, did you remember uh, prayers by heart? We remember prayers by heart, especially my father. I, I also, I remember a lot of prayers. But the, my father's, one of my father's thinking was, even as a kid, I should remember prayers by heart. And did you pray in the camp? I don't think so. The thing most of us did at night, you know, there was nothing to do. And some people said, if you give them a slice of bread, there were some artists and there were some actors. They, they tried to play a play for you if you close your eyes or they'd play if you give them a slice of bread. My father used to, my, we were together, like I say, his brother they took away. So he had a cousin, the two sons, and I, my father and I, and I have a second cousin actually in uh, New Jersey now. His father was taken away to the left side and he was the only child, so he, he was with us. He was, the fifth, he was the fifth wheel. And my father used to tell us uh, basically Gemara, stories from the Gemara and stories from the Tanakh and so forth at night. And we listened to him till we fell asleep if we had time. It was too early, in the winter time especially. Do you remember conversations with your father at that time? Yes, they, we, we spoke a lot. I spoke more about it than I spoke to my father in my 15 years. I spoke more to him in, the, in that 11 months. Even though we never worked together on the same detail, we were separate at night, we used to talk. Did he try to guide you? to the rest of your life or no, something like that? No, we basically like spoke how mother could be and what happened and then he used to tell me, you know, basic told me stories, the Jewish life, what's the custom, why do we do this and why do Jews do this and, you know. Not about his family and what's well, going Well, family, to I knew the family, I knew the family. But basically it was his family that he's talking about. It was my sisters and my mother and my brother, whatever happened, especially my brother. No, I mean about your ancestors. Ancestors, uh, some, I know, basically, yeah that, 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 yeah, that I knew, that I knew before. I knew basically my family story, especially from my father's side. I knew them all. My grandfather's, all the brothers and all their kids and their grandkids, I knew them all. I knew each other. So uh, it was uh, not, a, not a small talk, but not, uh, not, not really discussing what you're going to do after. We didn't think, nobody thought what they're going to be after. So my father, I felt secure because I saw my father there. Thought nothing could go wrong till he didn't pass away. Then I, then, then I didn't know what I'm going to do. Then I was lost. What was your job in Kaufering? I had, I had quite a few jobs. I somehow or other, every couple of weeks I had another job. And luckily, I had good enough jobs that saw me through the hunger times when I didn't have nothing. I was, um, first I was working on the railroad, but then I was strong yet, knocking him, piling in nails into the railroad, and you know, the railroad tracks. But not slapping the... Not slapping, no, the knocking in the spikes. And my father had a good job all the way through. He only had one job, basically. And soon he came out, they asked who's a mechanic, and he said, 
he knows mechanics because we had a tractor in us and, and they took him up. If you ever seen in a rear yard, there's a tower where, where they guide the range. In those days, they used to do it by hand. They pulled the, they pulled the grate, they pulled the wires. And he was working the tower with two Holland, Hollandese foremen. They were making you know, the wires, the connections, they had to make clippings, so they were. And he was working basically as a iron metal worker. And they, they were pretty nice to him, like I say. He had his habits. I think even today, if he would have eaten meat, he probably could have survived. I don't know what would have happened to him after he survived and he found out that he has no family except me. That's a different story, but I guess a lot of people learn to live with it because they survived. Well, basically he tried to be, I don't even want to eat meat. They brought him in a little piece of chicken and snuck it in for me. But he ate the bread, but they gave him what the extra bread or whatever, but he wouldn't. Me, and then I, I worked on, after the railroad, I worked for a couple of weeks, we were digging wells. Well, about this big. We had to sit in a chair and dog around us and let the things drop. And there, it was school, it wasn't too hot, you were inside the well, and you only worked two or three hours, they pulled you out, then you could lay down for two hours to, to rest. And then again, because you couldn't work more than two, three hours at a time. Because they had to drop the pipes down for the, you just dug it out and they dropped the pipes. And then whatever else did I work? I worked for about two or three weeks. I was lucky enough to get in, we were only 20 people, and it was the quartermaster, it was the warehouse, the food warehouse, which the army got the food, the, and the camps got the food, and we were only 20 Jewish, Jewish kids from, from our camp. The rest of them are mostly Ukrainian girls, you know, that they brought in forced labor camp. And there were some Wehrmacht soldiers. We had to load the trucks with the food that they gave out. And there, we had extra food because the lunch they gave us, the lunch, they, whatever they cooked for themselves, we ate with them. But it was hard. Over there, I never forget. And Germans were Germans. And one of the Ukrainian girls came out. It was a duck fight. You know what the duck fight is in the air. And she said, look, a German plane was just shut down. The Sess took his gun and just shot her down the plug. Because she said the Germans. So you had to, even there we were friendly, we were working close, we had to watch very careful. And there was, uh, and then I started working, I worked, worked for filling some uh, gas, helium, uh, for, and for that we had to go to Augsburg. And there we met some other Hungarian girls because the, there was an air raid in the leather mud. We had to fill up the, so we went with the truck. And I found always some other jobs. The best job I had, and I think, which I have to thank, thank that I'm alive, was when we worked in Munich on the railroad. I fell into a, uh, to, uh, a commando that was about 60 of us. We were fixing the railroad in Munich because we were only 60 kilometers out of Munich. And over there, that was already right towards the end, it was in February and March, and the Americans bombed by clock, six o'clock in the at night and eight o'clock in the morning. So we got there, whatever they bombed during the night, we fixed in the morning and they bombed it at night. So we were doing, you know, the work on the same spot. 